And considering that we had this, you know, this huge Tea Party movement in 2010, there's been very little talk about actually cutting spending, really, uh, other, than, other than Ron Paul, who has some you know, very big spending cut plans. But as far as the other candidates, we've heard very little about it, other than oh, Mitt Romney doesn't want a lunar colony. That I'm pretty clear about. Hi, I'm Nick Gillespie with Reason TV, and today we're talking with James Pethokoukas of the American Enterprise Institute. Thank you, Jim, for talking to us. Ah, thanks for having me. Appreciate you uh, cover economics, government, uh, f uh, fiscal policy, things like that. R right now, what is the biggest threat to the American economy and any possible recovery that you're, uh, that you're covering? Well, the thing that worries me is this economy just is not growing very fast. It hasn't, it hasn't grown very fast for really uh, a decade. And if you look in the future, it's not, it's not predicted to grow particularly fast. Now, some of those are, there's some you know, demographic re reasons. Uh, you have aging of the uh, workforce. Uh, you have fewer people going into the workforce. But there just seems to be a real lack of vitality in this, uh, in this economy. And all, yeah. listen, all, those econ all the problems, all the deficit problems, debt problems, they all look a lot worse if the economy is not growing. So what are the government policies? Uh, you know, I'm a big believer, and I suspect you are too, that government can't really, uh, you know, it can't mastermind the economy, but it can get out of the way or set certain uh, kind of uh, frameworks that allow for bigger growth. What are the things the government should be doing and what has it been doing? The number one thing uh, the government can do right now is really create a tax system uh, which is pro-growth. Right now we have a, a tax system which penalizes capital investment, which is very important uh, for you know, cr you know, creating new innovation, new, new products, the new companies of the future. Uh, so I like to see a tax system that didn't penalize capital so much. We have this really high corporate tax rate. I like to bring that down. Uh, dramatically. So, I mean, that's not the only thing, and sometimes I feel like, you know, on my blog, I feel like I'm all running about is let's cut taxes, let's right. cut taxes. Uh, but I think that I think that's part of it. Uh, what is the, what's the spending it. equation in uh, creating a debt overhang that we're, or hangover that we're in? Well, it's, it's, it's amazing that uh, during, during the Republican um, nominating process, there's been very, considering that we had this, you know, this huge Tea Party movement in 2010, there's been very little talk about actually cutting spending, really, uh, other, than, other than Ron Paul, who has some you know, very big spending cut plans. But as far as the other candidates, they're talking about, let's say, Paul Ryan's plan you know, to, to cut Medicare spending in the future. But as far as like, cutting real things right now, uh, we've, we've heard very little about it, other than other than Mitt Romney doesn't want a lunar colony. That I'm pretty clear about. But everything else, they're, they don't want to talk about it. Why didn't the uh, stimulus work? And what does that tell us about the current state of macroeconomic theory? Right. Uh, right. We had some stimulus under Bush. We had some temporary tax cuts. Uh, Milton Friedman said that these sorts of temporary tax cuts tend not to work because people know they're temporary and they don't change. They'll end up saving the money. They won't change uh, their long-term, like you know, spending or investment or savings patterns. Uh, if they think the tax cut's going to go away. So the, uh, the, the president's stimulus we had three parts. It had this, had this tax cut part, which was temporary, which no one thought would work. And was dribbled out. That was dribbled out in very big, you know, because that's, that's what this hot new craze, behavioral economics, said they should do. Uh, it turns out it really didn't work. Uh, and then he also had this, this huge, you know, infrastructure spending component, uh, which uh, it, it's, it's interesting is that people, they could have gone and asked the Congressional Budget Office what was going to happen, and they would have said, well, guess what, these things tend not to work, it takes very long to get them up and running. So that, that almost was not unexpected. I think what the administration maybe didn't expect uh, was all the regulatory hurdles uh, that these projects would have to go with, uh, so it took them that much longer to get them, to get them up and running. So now, we, now we're here three years, three years later, and the economy is only growing under 2%. Over the past couple of years, I mean, there has just been these huge convulsions in you know financial markets globally, locally, and whatnot. Uh, what, how, how has it made you rethink some of your assumptions about uh, you know what constitutes good economic policy or good fiscal policy? Uh, it's it's really made me, you know, wonder. You know, what do I what do I know? What do I don't know? There was so much about that financial crisis where we didn't understand the various linkages. Uh, people didn't understand the, the whole sort of shadow derivatives market, the whole shadow banking market. And I, I, I didn't realize there was so much that I didn't know about. And it's really made me, more, I think, more cautious 
uh, about you know advocating this policy or that policy and thinking a lot more about what are the unintended consequences. Let's look at the unintended consequences first uh, before we look at the policy and really taking more of sort of a do-no-harm approach to public policy. We live in an age where econo economists are on the bestseller list all the time it seems. Are we becoming more economically literate as a kind of voting population and if so is that is that going to be helpful or do we have a lot of people who know a little bit and then that's going to gum up the works? Well, I, w I wish people would know a lot more. I mean, I, 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 I would like to see more study of economics and personal finance uh, in high school because even though, even though uh, you know, economists, they disagree on a lot, there, there generally are some big things they tend to agree on. They, they, they still tend to agree on that, you know, that, tra that trade is a good right. thing, uh, that you know, prices, prices need to float freely, those kinds of things. Uh, I th hopefully, if, if people are you know, more aware of you know, what sound economics is, the, you know, the, you know, the, just sort of the general principles, uh, they can hold the public officials, you know, much more accountable and understand what they're doing. Great. Well, I want to thank Jim Pethokoukas of the American Enterprise Institute for talking with Reason TV. You can check out his blog writing and, and other articles at American.com. Uh, AEI.org, American.com, you'll find it eventually. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you.